Time and again, the American scene has been shattered by assassins. From Lincoln to Martin Luther King, from the Kennedys to John Lennon. Each and every time, a gun or rifle was the weapon of choice, and the aftermath of each and every shooting left the course of history forever altered. But assassination is hardly an American phenomenon. Throughout the 20th century, the guns of infamy have created profound political change in nations as diverse as Mexico and Egypt, Italy, and India. With a flash of gunpowder and a deafening roar, time stood still for an instant. When the smoke finally cleared, it revealed a vastly different world. One such moment occurred on July 20th, 1923 in the small Mexican town of Peral. It was here that one of the heroes of the Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa, was ambushed and killed. Prominent among the weapons used in the attack was the Winchester Rifle Model 94. The Winchester Model 94 is probably one of the finest and certainly the most widely produced firearms ever. To fire it, you simply loaded your cartridges in through here. They went into a tubular magazine beneath the barrel. And to chamber around it, you lowered the lever, closed it, and then all you had to do to fire the gun was pull the trigger. Pancho Villa was born to Mexican sharecroppers on a large hacienda in the state of Durango in 1878. Pancho Villa was both a man of history and a character of legendary proportions. The legend presents a former bandit who somehow managed to recruit men. No one knows who these men were, why they came, why they revolted, and made his mark on Mexican history simply by distributing some things to the poor, taking from the rich. The historical truth is much more difficult, and it's much more difficult than the legend because one has to explain how a man who had no education, came from the lowest groups of society, managed within a relatively short time to lead a huge force of 50,000 men, to transform a guerrilla army from an undisciplined group of men into a highly capable fighting force. In 1913, Villa's military genius would become legend at the Battle of Torreon, one of Mexico's wealthiest and most important cities. Villa led 10,000 men against 10,000 well-armed and well-trained federal troops. The first Battle of Torreon, which took place in mid-1913, was Villa's first victory. In order to take a city, you need artillery, and Villa had practically no artillery, while well, the Federal Army had a large amount of artillery. Nothing was standardized, so that this makes this first victory all the more amazing. Emboldened by his success at Torreon, Villa next turned his sights on the city of Juarez. There were trains regularly going between Chihuahua and Ciudad Juarez. Villa captured such a train, filled it with his own troops, and when the train pulled into Ciudad Juarez at two o'clock in the morning, just like the legend of the Trojan horse, they found no one at the station, and within two hours, Without any shots being fired, Villa captured Ciro Juarez. The federal commander in Chihuahua retreated to the border with the United States, and Villa suddenly became master of the state of Chihuahua. Villa's army, División del Norte, now approached 50,000 men. It was the largest revolutionary army ever mustered in Latin America. 
His next victory at the town of Zacatecas in 1914 sealed the revolution and was celebrated on the streets of Mexico City. The role of Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution was historic, but in the United States, he is best remembered for his ruthless attack on the small border town of Columbus, New Mexico. It was March 8, 1916, when Villa and about 400 men stormed Columbus. Before retreating back to Mexico, the Villistas sacked the town, burned the hotel, and murdered 17 Americans. The last time the United States was invaded, before Villa's invasion, was the War of 1812, when the British marched into the United States. There was no invasion of the metropolitan territory of the United States before that and since then. Villa's invasion of American soil created two distinct reactions, one personal, the other political, both of them extreme. There was great indignation. There were a whole series of lynchings of people who had absolutely nothing to do with Villa, who were lynched along the border by vigilantes. This was one reaction. The other was a political reaction. This was 1916. Presidential elections were to take place within a few months. And Wilson was forced to act. President Woodrow Wilson called it the punitive expedition. 10,000 men under the command of John J. Pershing crossed the border into Mexico with the sole purpose of bringing Pancho Villa to justice. In the end, the punitive expedition was a failure, and the consequences of that failure were both profound and unexpected. The presence of the Americans in Mexico, the invasion of Mexico, had created such a backlash of nationalism that Villa could increase his armies 20-fold. So it was quite the contrary of what the Americans expected. They could not capture Villa, and by early 1917, when Woodrow Wilson anticipated a war with Germany, he did not want to be distracted by Mexico and withdrew his troops unconditionally from Mexico. Villa would not live long enough to see the fruits of the revolution he had fought so hard to achieve. In 1920, he made peace with the government and moved with his family to a small hacienda in his home state of Durango. But those in power still feared that Villa would turn against them and took steps to ensure that he didn't. The ambush came on July 20th, 1923 as Villa drove through the small town of Peral. As the car went to one of the most frequented corners in Parral, eight men began shooting at him. He died immediately. Only one of his guards who was with him in the car escaped. All the others, his secretary and all the other guards were shot. I've seen pictures of Villa's car, and it looks to me like there were a, a great number of shots that went into that car, uh, both handgun and rifle shots. You have to remember, in an ambush situation, the object is to get as many shots fired as fast as possible and get the heck out of there. The actual guns used in the assassination of Pancho Villa have long since disappeared. And though the life of Mexico's greatest revolutionary hero ended in a hail of bullets, his memory and his legend remain very much alive. I still remember it was a Friday and um, I was uh, coming back from school in the afternoon. And when I got home, I saw my mom, who was alone at home, uh, on the phone and sobbing uncontrollably, and uh, I didn't know what was going on. And so I went to her and I tried to console her, and uh, when she put the phone down, she told me that they had just heard that grandfather was assassinated and uh, he's dead. And I was so shocked that I just couldn't believe it. 
The assassination of Mahatma Gandhi stunned India and the world. One of history's great leaders had been cut down by a few shots from a 380 caliber Beretta automatic pistol. The little model 1934 Beretta was an extremely well-designed pistol. It, it was uh, it came after uh, some experimentation with what they called model 1932s, and it was an improvement upon them used by the Italian military for a good number of years. These guns were made in military versions, and even after World War II, in civilian versions. Somehow, one got to India and uh, ended up being the weapon of choice for the assassin of, uh, of Gandhi. Gandhi's assassination ended a life that had brought India's 700 million people from colonial imperialism to independence. Mahatma, or the Great Soul, had orchestrated sweeping political change by applying the philosophy of peaceful resistance. It remains the largest and most successful non-violent revolution in modern history, a revolution inspired and led by a devout and most unassuming figure. He was born Mohandas Gandhi on October 2nd, 1869, in the small city of Porbandar. His parents were members of India's upper class, and he was educated in private school. In 1888, Gandhi attended law school in England, and in 1891, was admitted to the bar of the High Court of London. Two years later, he accepted a job with a Muslim trading company in South Africa. Gandhi had come to South Africa to earn a living, but what he encountered would forever change his life. Within a week of his arrival in South Africa, he was humiliated because of the color of his skin, and he was physically thrown off the train there. And I think that was the turning point in his life because he says in his autobiography that he sat on the platform all night wondering how to get justice. Gandhi became a potent political force in South Africa and his ideas about non-violent political change found a following. In 1913, as an expression of his ethnic pride, Gandhi appeared at a meeting in Durban in traditional Indian garb. It would become his trademark. Gandhi would never wear Western clothes again. In 1915, Gandhi went home to India after an absence of more than 20 years. And so he spent that year traveling and uh, reconnecting with the people, the common man. And he saw the poverty and the destitution and, and all the uh, problems that the people faced there. And he began to identify with them. And so gradually he discards all his own Western habits. He stopped speaking in English and he stops dressing in the English fashion. He, he begins to dress like the poor man. And all of that to identify himself with the, uh, the common man. Gandhi understood that India was suffering and that the British colonial government was profiting from her misery. Gandhi knew that Indian cloth was being shipped to England where it was fashioned into garments and then sold back to Indians. He encouraged his followers to spin their own cotton into thread and then sew their own clothes. A simple spinning wheel had become an icon for revolution. Everybody except Gandhi had a very limited concept of uh, the philosophy of nonviolence. They thought that nonviolence is uh, uh, only confined to the non-use of physical force. That as long as we are not beating up people and killing people, that we are nonviolent. But Gandhi had to explain to them that that was not what uh, it means. It means much more than that. And he was able to then convince them that we are not going to consider the British enemies at all. They are our friends and we are not fighting them in a war. We are trying to convince them that their attitude and their thinking is wrong and that they need to change that. And when we part, we want to part as friends. Now that was a very alien concept to everybody. On March 12, 1930, 
At the age of 61, the Mahatma began his most important journey. He would walk 247 miles to the shore of the Indian Ocean and make salt. The British taxed salt and controlled its production and sale. Even though salt could be easily produced by single families in small quantities, the practice was illegal because it violated the British monopoly. Gandhi left his ashram with a few faithful followers, and by the time he reached the sea, the numbers had grown to tens of thousands. That was one thing on which he could rally the whole country. Uh, the rich, the poor, the Hindus, the Muslims, everybody. It gave the common people in India a feeling that they had the power, that they could defy the uh, British government, that they didn't have to have weapons to uh, face them, but they could do it with, a, with moral strength. And that was the point from which the struggle gained momentum. And by 1940s, uh, the British decided that they had to quit. On August 15, 1947, Gandhi's dream of an independent India was finally realized. The British departed, and the former colony was now a nation. It is no small coincidence that the insignia which dominates the Indian flag is a spinning wheel. With independence came the establishment of not one, but two neighboring nations, a Hindu India and a Muslim Pakistan. The partitioning of the two countries caused widespread rioting and violence. Once again, Mahatma Gandhi placed himself in harm's way. If Hindu and Muslim did not stop killing one another, he declared he would fast until his death. The hunger strike uh, to bring about peace between the Hindus and the Muslims uh, had a tremendous uh, impact on both sides uh, because both sides didn't want uh, his death to be on their conscience. And so finally, he was able to bring about peace between the fighting uh, groups uh, in Calcutta. Although Hindu and Muslim had laid down their weapons, their hatred for one another did not subside. On January 30th, 1948, that hatred found a target in the Mahatma himself. Usually at five o'clock in the evening, he would go for his prayer services. And his prayer services were public prayers. And so one of my sisters-in-law my cousin's wife uh, went and uh, showed the watch to grandfather and said, you're 20 minutes late. And uh, so he walked towards the uh, crowds, uh, towards the designated place where he was to uh, perform the prayer service. There. there were crowds all around him. Everybody was trying to greet him and be near him and touch him. In that crowd was this assassin. And he just popped out of the crowd in front of him and he just pulled out his gun and shot him point blank. The Beretta pistol which Godse fired at Mahatma Gandhi currently rests in the Gandhi National Museum in New Delhi. The day after his assassination, Gandhi's funeral procession snaked through New Delhi for five hours. Millions of mourners filled the streets all over India. The passing of the Great One was marked in ceremonies around the world. Coping with grandfather's death and uh, trying to understand how uh, all of these things happened, the fact that we have traditionally kill people who talk about nonviolence and practice nonviolence uh, is an irony. The reason we are killing the people who profess and practice this philosophy is because they are talking the truth and we don't want to hear the truth. For many people, the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi remain the essence of truth. But at another moment in history, the diabolical fantasies of a madman were embraced as a very different truth. It was the afternoon of April 30th, 1945, 50 feet below the streets of Berlin. 
Inside the Fuhrer bunker, Adolf Hitler and his bride, Eva Braun, retire to their small concrete bedroom. That single shot, fired from an unknown pistol, ended Adolf Hitler's reign of terror and finished the Third Reich. It was the last sentence in the darkest chapter of the 20th century. The final scene in a macabre and surreal drama which had played out in the Fuhrer bunker during the last two weeks of Hitler's life. What one saw in the bunker was, uh, this was a tomb. I think for Hitler, the sense that he was doomed he understood this. The city was doomed. The Third Reich was doomed. And so it was, in a way, appropriate. This was the right place to be, not in the fresh air of Berchtesgaden, holding out in the Alps. But this, this was his sarcophagus. This was his final resting place. By April of 1945, Berlin was surrounded by Russian, British, and American ground troops, while Allied planes kept up a non-stop day and night barrage of bombing. With his Reich collapsing all around him, Hitler and his inner circle retreated to the stifling concrete bunker. In that Fuhrer bunker in, in the bowels of the earth, there's no sense of time. Nobody knows really unless you can sold your watch, whether it's daylight, whether it's, it's dark, it's 3 a.m., 3 p.m. So there is this, this, this fantastic world that seems to prevail. In addition to the netherworld within the bunker, Hitler's own health was rapidly deteriorating. The last known photos of Adolf Hitler were taken outside the bunker on April 20th, 1945. The last photographs we have of him are as he's inspecting the Hitler youth, boys 10, 12, 13 years old who were being sent out not on parade, but with uh, Panzerfaust, the, the little anti-tank weapons to hold off the Russians. Uh, that picture of Hitler, too, uh, is, is one of the, is a phantom. On April 22nd, Hitler attended his daily military briefing and learned that the Nazi efforts to repel the Russians were failing. In fact, the counterattack had not yet begun, and worse, the Russians were now entering Berlin. He goes into an absolute rage, one of these towering rages for which he was famous, uh, in which he said, I've, I've been betrayed. The German people have finally shown themselves to be weak. I will never leave Berlin. I will never leave this bunker. I will not go, uh, and I will fight to the end. And if, when that is done, then I'll commit suicide. On April 27th, Hitler's staff picked up a disturbing radio broadcast. Hitler's closest advisor and trusted friend, SS officer Heinrich Himmler, had been discussing surrender with the Allies. Himmler was the truest of the true. And now to hear that the Reichsführer SS, on his own initiative, was trying to negotiate peace with the West, was for Hitler really the final straw. If Himmler could be guilty of this kind of betrayal, then that, that was it. One of Himmler's trusted aides, General Hermann Fagelein, had remained in the bunker. Fagelein was married to Gretel Brown, the sister of Hitler's mistress, Eva Brown. Although he was effectively a member of the first family, Fagelein sensed the impending doom within the bunker and slipped away undetected. Nobody noticed it for a couple of days, but after that broadcast, of Himmler's treachery, they looked around and Hitler said, where's Fagelein? Where is he? And saw, of course, his, his absence as proof positive of an SS conspiracy. He sent out the detectives. Imagine this, with Russian troops fighting street by street, dodging bombs, dodging artillery shells, this group of detectives leaves the bunker, makes their way out to Charlottenburg, which is a fairly long way away from the bunker find the man. They found him in his apartment, 
brought him back to the bunker where he made a plea for, I, I was not guilty, I'm not involved in this, uh, hoped that Ava Brown would intervene on his behalf. She didn't, and he was shot. By April 27th, the Russians were on the streets of Berlin. The pressure inside the Fuhrer bunker was excruciating, and the madness took an unexpected turn. On this night, there is a bizarre scene in the bunker. Those who have remained have chosen to do so. Uh, Hitler, in effect, is saying farewell. Hitler made available to those who stayed uh, cyanide capsules to his secretaries. When he finally took leave of his secretaries, uh, he handed them the, the poison capsule and said, I wish I had a better parting gift for you. By midnight, April 29th, the Russian army was closing in on the bunker. Adolf Hitler chose this moment to attend to a deeply personal matter. Ava Brown had had a, sh a very shadow existence in the Third Reich. She was never known to the German public, never explained, they didn't see photographs of her, didn't see films of her. Uh, his entourage spoke of her sometimes simply as, as E.B. She wanted to be married. And Hitler agreed there would be a wedding ceremony in the bunker. His secretaries uh, set out what was left of the, the fine china, the, the gold inlaid uh, decorations for the table, and a ceremony of, of marriage was conducted. Hitler and Ava Brown were married. Of all the bizarre events of the uh, bunker, life in the bunker, this was par probably the, the coup de grace. This was the final, the final uh, enactment or the final installment in this very strange play indeed. By noon on April 30th, Russian troops were just blocks from the bunker. It was the moment of defeat. Adolf Hitler enacted his final scene. He and now Frau Hitler, Eva Brown, uh, went into the private apartments. It was understood that Hitler was about to take his own life. Standing in the corridor, uh, a shot was heard. And then finally, an SS officer pushed his way into the room. Eva Brown was stretched out on the, the sofa. Her eyes wide open, the stench of cyanide heavy in the air, so heavy that everyone who came into the room said, I didn't think I'd be able to get this out of my clothes. It was so overwhelming. And that Hitler was slumped over in a chair just to the right of the sofa with uh, blood on his face and a pistol uh, on the floor. But the identity of the gun which Adolf Hitler used in his suicide remains a mystery. No weapon was ever found by the Russians when they entered the Fuhrer bunker on May 2nd. To complicate matters, the corpses of both Hitler and Eva Braun were burned immediately after their deaths, making any forensic ballistic analysis impossible. However, most believe that a 32 caliber Walther pocket pistol was Hitler's weapon of choice. The Walther PP uh, series of pistols, which includes the PPK, uh, was probably one of the finest uh, pocket pistols ever made. It was one of the first uh, double action pocket pistols, which meant that you could carry the gun with a round in the chamber safely, and all you had to do to fire the first round was pull the trigger. It's my guess that if, in fact, Hitler used one of these guns to commit suicide, he would not go through the double action uh, procedure. Uh, it would be much easier to have the gun cocked and just to fire it single action. The suicide of Adolf Hitler was the last desperate act of a madman. It marked the end of the insane drama which had played out in the Fuhrer bunker. But that insanity would soon be overshadowed when Allied troops discovered the evidence of the Holocaust. The world would soon learn that Adolf Hitler had unleashed the unthinkable. 
contained within his last will and political testament, which he signed just hours before his suicide, Adolf Hitler summarized his rationale and justification for history's most shocking crime. He says, no one should believe that in 1939 I or anyone else in Germany wanted war. This war was brought on by that people which has thrown Europe into chaos uh, for centuries upon end, the Jews, or those international statesmen who were controlled by the Jews. This was the message that he sent out to the world uh, 24 hours before his death, that he left the world with. and. His suicide was, I think, his final punctuation mark. October 6, 1981. The president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, was presiding over a military parade commemorating the 1973 Egyptian victory over Israel. It took four assassins less than a minute to complete their mission. Each of them carried an AK-47 automatic rifle. The AK-47 was designed by Mikhail uh, Dimitrievich Kalashnikov, a uh, Russian designer, obviously. It was chambered in a 762 by 39 caliber. It's what's called, it is a true assault rifle. That means that it can be fired in either semi-automatic or full automatic mode. The AK-47 in its fully automatic mode has a cyclic rate of fire of 600 rounds per minute. Uh, that means that four assassins had a firepower of 120 rounds they could discharge in a matter of seconds. Anwar Sadat didn't stand a chance. In the West, Anwar Sadat is perhaps best remembered for the Camp David Accords, which he negotiated with Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and U.S. President Jimmy Carter. Although the Accords were completed on March 31, 1979, Sadat's bold and striking peace initiative preceded the historic signing by two years. On November 21, 1977, President Anwar Sadat, ruler of the most powerful nation in the Arab world, arrived in Jerusalem. His unexpected gesture of reconciliation toward a bitter enemy took everyone by surprise. What no one anticipated was the drama and the speed that accompanies Sadat's move. Sadat moved so rapidly and so dramatically, he captured the imagination and uh, really created a, a psychological revolution that the Middle East hasn't recovered from yet and probably is responsible today for the very nature of the peace process as we see it today between Israel and other Arab states and Israel and the Palestinians. But at the time of Sadat's visit, many within Egypt and the Arab world were outraged by his overture to Israel. In fact, some extremists openly called for his death. My father, the way I see him at that time and from his work for his country as a freedom fighter, and after the wars, his sense of humanity was greater than his sense of the self, because he knew he was going to be killed for that. He wrote, actually, his own epitaph before he went to Israel. That was four years before he was assassinated. And he said in it, President Sadat, hero of war, hero of peace, lived for peace and marked it for his principles. Sadat expected his assassination. The day before the shootings, he had reports that something was afoot, but chose to ignore them. Although his murder was a shock, what surprised everyone was the fact that the assassins were military officers, and Sadat was a military hero. The army are his children. That's the word that he always used every time he goes and meets with any unit. He always called them his children. And he used to introduce them to us. This is your brother. This is your sister. So it wasn't only that, you know, that he called them his children. No, they were introduced to us as brothers. 
So how could it be that this military hero was murdered by his own troops? And how could they have breached the extraordinary security? Lieutenant Khalid Ahmad Shaki El Islambouli was arrested with two accomplices at the scene. The fourth assassin was arrested a few days later. During the trial, it was revealed that only Islambouli was a member of the Egyptian army. His three accomplices were all civilians. Islambouli took part in the parade rehearsals and provided his team of assassins with signed army orders, which allowed them to enter the base where the parade was being organized. On the morning of the parade, Islambouli and his team of assassins loaded their AK-47 automatic rifles and drove their truck past the reviewing stand. Many in the stands thought it was a military exercise that was part of the parade. Sadat himself seemed unaware of the danger. He took the bullet from under his right arm because he was saluting. It went through the heart, came out of his left neck, killed him in 45 seconds. I read the report of his death. 45 seconds. He, he, he died standing. I think his disappearance was a quite devastating for Arab-Israeli peace. Through his courageous acts, um, Sadat acquired extreme uh, sense of credibility in the West, in Israel. And that clout that came with that authority um, would have translated into pushing the peace process forward. But I think the drama and the psychological impact that we now are witnessing some 20 years after the signing of the, the Egyptian-Israeli agreements would not have taken place without the drama of the Sadat visit to Jerusalem. That was the psychological barrier being shattered. All four of the assassins were found guilty and executed. During the trial, Islam Bouli was asked whether he pleaded guilty or not guilty. He replied, I killed him, but I am not guilty. I did what I did for the sake of religion and my country. Once again, extremists armed with the guns of infamy had deprived the world of a much needed leader. May 13th, 1981, St. Peter's Square the Vatican. Pope John Paul II was greeting thousands of Catholic pilgrims who had come to Rome. After only three short years, the political legacy of the energetic Pope was already emerging. John Paul II was shot twice in the stomach and once in the hand. Immediately after the shooting, the crowd wrestled the gunman to the ground. His name was Mehmet Aliaja. The weapon was a 9mm Browning automatic pistol. This is a Browning high power. It's a single action, 9mm, uh, semi-automatic, high capacity magazine auto pistol. Uh, it was considered until some of the more modern double action 9mm autos to be the finest automatic pistol of its time. The advantage of the Browning High Power is it's semi-automatic. You can fire it very rapidly. As fast as you can pull that trigger, you can get a round off. Plus, it has a large capacity. The magazine holds 12 rounds. Uh, the fact that the Pope took three hits, two in the stomach and one in the wrist, and managed to survive is phenomenal. The Pope fully recovered, and Mehmet Ali Aja was jailed immediately. However, Aja's background and his motives would take years to sort out. Aja emerged out of the very murky, very violent world of Turkish politics in the 1970s. We know that he was accused of and confessed to the killing of a very prominent Turkish newspaper editor as a political crime uh, and was sent to jail for it. Uh, and he escaped from that jail under very mysterious circumstances. In the months following the assassination attempt, Aja made a series of startling confessions and allegations. In the end, 
he claimed that the shooting of the Pope had been orchestrated and masterminded by the Soviet KGB. Although it was an outrageous charge, it was not without a certain logic. In Moscow's eyes, Pope John Paul II must have seemed like the scariest individual to come down the pike in a long, long time, because he was such an inspirational figure and because he came from Poland. And here, all of a sudden, in this deeply Catholic country, is this articulate, young, charismatic man who sits on St. Peter's throne and denounces them. This was an enormously dangerous development for the Soviet Union uh, from the very onset, without the Pope really doing much more than just being the Pope. Five years after the attack, the Italian prosecutors brought their charges of a wider conspiracy to court. Unfortunately, the case relied heavily on their star witness, Mehmet Ali Aja. The trial, which began in the early fall of 1986, turned into quite a show because of Aja himself. Um, he claimed to be Jesus Christ at one point. He was, at best, a very complicated person, at worst, a lunatic. But amongst all of Aja's wild claims was at least one which contained a thread of truth. He claimed, in a moment of lucidity, that there was no government anywhere in the world, either in the East or West, that wanted to know the truth of this assassination attempt. And that statement had a kind of logic to it. Certainly nobody in the East wanted the truth to come out, and at that point, five years down the road, with the Pope fully recovered, fully vigorous, you could argue that the Italians had not much interest in opening up this can of worms, that the United States didn't have much interest. I mean, what do you do if you prove that the KGB tried to kill the leader of the Roman Catholic Church? I mean, do you go to war? Do you indict the leader of the Soviet Union for war crimes? What do you do? In the end, the jury convicted Aja of the crime and concluded that although there was evidence of a conspiracy, it could not be proven. Though history may have forgotten the conspiracy theories that surrounded the shooting of Pope John Paul II, the tragedy produced at least one moment which many still see as defining, the moment when John Paul came face to face with the man who tried to kill him. The Pope very graciously and very profoundly spoke of forgiving Aja. Uh, but they talked for a good long while. Uh, it was longer than it would have taken for the Pope simply to say, I forgive you, my son, and you know, let's pray to God together. And you have to wonder whether the Pope said, who sent you? Or did anybody send you? How did you, how did you get to St. Peter's Square? And who knows what Aja would have said to him. We'll never know. Pope John Paul II lived to absolve his would-be assassin and survived to carry out the life's work he had begun. But others who have left their mark upon the 20th century were denied that opportunity. One can only imagine how different the world might be if they had lived long enough to see their dreams fulfilled each of them left their footprints upon the path of history and each of their journeys was cut short by the crackling roar of an infamous gun. <laughs>